All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Gym Fear 138 podcast. We are, we are back in 2016. No, wait. We're back in 2017. That's right. I told you guys it was going to take a while for me to get used to the year change thing. It's, I, I have trouble with it. It's going to go on until about the end of January, then we're going to get into February. And after having had to write it every day, like six times a day, then I'll be ready. Uh, I'll, I'll be able to, to remember that we are in 2017 right now. So, uh, yeah, this week has been fucking crazy, fam. Like, what the fuck is even happening anymore? Do you, do you know? Because I don't. I've lost all hope. I've lost all hope. The universe is never going to make sense again, guys. Ever. Not, not at all. It's just not. You know, like, I, I it seems like I'm getting my life together just barely. Just barely. Everything's tied with, like, shoestrings and scotch tape and gum. But I'm getting my life together, and everything else is just falling the fuck apart. It's like, it's like this weird power transference where my shit starts to come up, and it takes so much energy in the universe to make my shit be marginally okay that reality itself has started to fucking crumble as my life becomes more stable. <laughs> so apparently this has all been my fault. <laughs> like, I got a job and the world started falling the fuck apart. <laughs> That's why I'm one of those people who can't say, oh, 2016 is just the worst year ever. Well, not not for me. You know, I, I got a job, started making started making some money. You know, I got I, I started an audiobook career. I'm doing pretty successful. You know, I started I started a website and it's doing all right. I get, you know, in between 40 and 200 hits or so per per little post that I release and that's that's pretty okay for a first year. You know, the podcast seems to be doing well. People seem to like it, which by the way, the Hugos are coming up, guys. The Hugos are coming up. So, if you feel like getting involved with the Hugos, which I I personally don't, because I just I really just don't want to pay like 40 bucks to vote in something that's already like they rigged the vote anyway like they went ahead and wrote the vote rigging into the bylaws apparently so i'm just not gonna fuck with the hugos i'll go with like the gemmel awards or the dragon awards or something like that which those are open as well i believe maybe not the dragons i know the gemmels are open but dan wolfgang on twitter at azu rain sorry if i mispronounced your name dude um azu Azu, it's A Z U underscore R A Y N, so it looks like Azu Rain to me. But he released a uh, a post on a QQmedia.com, which is called a very special message about puka related sadness. Now, I'm not exactly sure what a puka is, but um, I wanted to thank this dude because he basically this post is a slate for the dragons and the Hugos. He's just like, you know, here's here's the things that I think people should nominate for these. It's not affiliated with the sad puppies because that there was recently a, a pretty big kerfuffle about that. And that was pretty funny too. But yeah, the sad puppies are basically imploding in on themselves under the engorged egos of the people who are running it. Um, but one thing I really do want to thank this guy for is he's put together this list of things that people can nominate for these uh, for these awards, and he has suggested my podcast as best fan cast, as as the the Hugo for the best fan cast, and I know it doesn't mean like anything so far as the actual Hugos are concerned, like it, it's probably not going to go anywhere, but. Thank you, dude. That means a lot to me that you enjoy the show. I really do appreciate that. So y'all go follow him on Twitter. He's an all right guy. He's a lot of fun to talk to. And and I really do appreciate that you enjoy the podcast, man. Thanks a lot. Uh, I, like, I haven't won anything, but the fact that you think I'm worth getting 
you know, posted on someone's slate alongside like John Mollison and Jeffro Johnson and Geek Gab and the Superversive Fiction Roundtable. Like that that means a lot to be put in that in that company by uh by somebody. Especially since I just like get drunk and yell in my room. Like that's it. Like, <laughs> that's my fucking podcast. I, I I drink and I scream about all kinds of random bullshit. So it's probably not gonna go anywhere. You're probably not gonna see me on the uh, on the Hugo nominations, but but the fact that somebody thinks that I'm worthy of being there, uh, I assume with respect to what people want the Hugos to be again, and what they were, um, not the uh, not the the you know circle jerk that it is now. That that does mean a lot that you think that I should be up there with Jeffro and and the guys over at Geek Gab. Uh, Brian and Daddy Warpig and and the people at the Superverse of uh, Fiction Roundtable. That means a lot. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm glad somebody out there is enjoying the fucking show. <laughs> now where the fuck was I? So oh yeah, I'll leave I'll leave links to this guy's Twitter um and that post because there's a lot of other good shit in here that you should check out. I say there's some stuff for uh, best graphic story that I want to look up because I'm assuming that's comics and I love comics. There's uh, some John C. Wright in here. And uh, yeah, uh, Donald Ike fluked. Um, you guys remember I told you about that in one of my in one of my I think that was the Halloween episode uh, in the days of the Witch Queens. He uh, he recommends to be nominated for best short story in the Hugos, which I would fully support that. That story was fucking awesome. So, yeah, go check out these this guy's recommendations. And look him up. I think uh, he even he even recommends uh, Kirsova. Yeah, uh, best editor short form P. Alexander Kirsova, and uh, Kirsova for best semi prosine. This isn't the actual Hugo nominations or anything like that. This is what this guy thinks should be on the Hugo nominations. So go go check it out and and go check out the stuff that that he nominated because from what I understand, most of this is really good shit. So anyway. Uh, yeah, I'll put links to that in the description, in the show notes, depending on whether you're watching this on YouTube or you're listening to it on my website. Or iTunes. But, in regards to reality breaking down, so most of you have probably heard about the tr the Trump golden showers thing. <laughs> I'm just, this had me dying. Like, I woke up one morning, like two days ago. Yeah, it was it was my day off. I woke up one morning on Wednesday and I was just like, oh, fuck it. I'll just check Twitter. So I opened my phone and I opened the Twitter app and I just start scrolling and I see like golden showers and I'm like, why are people talking about pissing on each other? What, what the fuck has Twitter come to? You know, how is this, how is this a real thing that's, that's actually uh, a hashtag on, on Twitter that it, I believe it was trending at one point, like Jesus Christ. And it's like, I haven't even had my fucking coffee yet. And all these people are talking about, like, Trump getting pissed on by Russian prostitutes. It's just like, we have officially left Earth, guys. We've, we're we gone. We're out in nowhere. We're out in outer space. This is, this is way too fucking wild for me. The universe is officially collapsing. I was almost driven to day drinking by that shit. But yeah, I, like... I've heard a lot of people talk about this from Ben Shapiro to Mark Levin to the guys on the uh, Federalist Radio Hour. Um, I don't think the conservatarians got to it. They'll probably get to it this week. But, uh, Jesus Christ. Like, how did anybody take this seriously? And this is just like the nail in the coffin for BuzzFeed. This is the end of BuzzFeed right here. Like, they might be in legal trouble over this, from what I hear. It certainly sounds libelous. <laughs> And I wouldn't blame Trump a bit for for taking legal action against BuzzFeed for this. Because the guy came out on Twitter and he published a memo that he sent to everybody. And he was just like, yeah, this is what I think that we should be doing as journalists in 2017. And we don't know if it's true. It might not be true. You know, we'll, we may never be able to confirm it, but we'll just put it out there anyway and start unfounded rumors about Donald Trump hating Barack and Michelle Obama so much that he went to a Russian hotel that they stayed at and paid a bunch of Russian prostitutes to piss on the bed. <laughs> it's over. 
It's over, fam. Everything that we thought was real is just sand. We've been building on sand for the entirety of humanity. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do about this. Like, just, like, the only thing that I can think of is to just find whoever published this seriously. Like, to my understanding, CNN ran with it. But that doesn't surprise me because CNN is so fake that, you know, like, their teeth are wooden at CNN. They're so fucking fake. They're so full of shit, their eyes are turning brown. So the one thing that I can think of is something that uh, another buddy on Twitter sent to me which I will find it in a minute. It's an essay by C.S. Lewis. I've just, I've got to scroll down here through my notes, my notifications. Here we go. It's, uh, it's called After Priggery What? On Wicked Journalists by C.S. Lewis. And the guy did a really neat video. It's, it's all, you know, hand-drawn and everything like that. It's, it's a really cool video. Um, and he explains some of the uh, more esoteric terms that, that Lewis uses. But basically, the uh, the kind of general thrust of this is that, you know, when journalists lie so much that everybody knows they lie, but they still keep buying the papers, because, you know, you have to keep up with what's going on, after all, that the best solution is to not be a dick about it, just send them to Coventry, which means, you know, socially disassociate with this person. Uh, he, he, call, he, he likens it to drawing a sanitary circle around them and just nobody go over there and talk to that guy. Nobody go buy that guy's newspaper. And I think that's what needs to be done with websites like BuzzFeed and to an extent CNN at this point. We need to just send them to Coventry. Just don't click on their shit. Like, if you... If you hear somebody talking about CNN, and this is especially important for bigger uh, personalities on Twitter or YouTube or whatever, do not, do not link the actual article because they will get clicks from that. Because this is the internet age, like in the 1920s, if a journalist was lying and the paper published nothing but lies, you would have to buy the paper. You would have to shell out your however many cents to buy the fucking paper to find out if they're lying to you after they've already established a record of lying. So instead of just stop buying the paper, you keep buying the fucking paper. Well, in this, this is the internet. We don't have to do that anymore. The game has completely changed thanks to websites like archive.is. So what you do, what you do is you click on the link and you go to the website and you give them one click, preferably with your ad block on. And then you copy their URL and you open up a new tab, and you type in archive.is, and you archive the page. And then you pass around the archive link. This is how we send modern-day journalists to Coventry. That's how we fucking do it, guys. You have to pass around archive links. You can't just, you can't just keep giving these people clicks, because that encourages them. It'll only convince them that what they have been doing is the right thing to do. Because that's what makes them money. If you choke off the advertising dollars by simply just not going to their websites and, and you know, sending around archives of their websites instead, then you choke off those advertising dollars and you choke off all of the clicks that they would have gotten from your audience, however large or meager it may be. Okay? So I think that that's a good idea that we should start doing, especially with sites like BuzzFeed and Slate and Vice and uh, Salon and Miss Magazine and the Mary Sue and uh, Gizmodo, all of these all of these organizations that we know are proven fucking liars. You don't give them your money anymore. You don't give them your clicks. You don't give them your time anymore. Clicks are money in the internet age, and if you refuse to give them your clicks, you are denying them advertising revenue. So, just archive it and send around the archive link. And that'll take care of these nasty fucking journalists who think that they can get away with printing obviously made-up bullshit, like this, uh, this Trump dossier. 
Everyone's calling it a dossier because some bullshit we pulled out of our ass when we hadn't even had our coffee in the morning doesn't sound quite as impressive, does it? Where'd I put my vodka? Found it! So yeah, this this video was sent to me by uh, Ogma underscore EM. You should go follow him. He's a cool guy, too. Uh, I'll put a link to his Twitter and a video in the uh, in the description or the show notes or whatever the fuck. You pick your poison. Um, it'll be down there. Go go check it out. Uh, but the video is very, very interesting. And C.S. Lewis perfectly describes what's happening right now with the media and what we can do about it. It's just that the method is out of date. So we just need to we just need to upgrade a little bit. Just upgrade it for the computer age, the internet age, the information superhighway, and just stop giving them clicks. That's it. It's as simple as fucking that, guys. We have the tools. We have the technology. We can rebuild them. Or rather, we can tear them down. It's, it's very possible. It's very possible to, to attack websites like this. You know, just just by simple denial of service. Just, we're not going to click on you. We're not going to visit your website. You're a liar. Eventually, they'll get wise. And if they don't, they'll be, you know, in, you know, flipping burgers or some shit. I don't know. I don't know what journalists do when they get fired from their journalism jobs and nobody will hire them anymore. But just because CNN has been around forever doesn't mean that CNN has to be around forever. You know what I mean? There's no such thing as too big to fail. CNN could go out of business tomorrow, and it wouldn't be that big of a deal, guys. You know, somebody else would rise up and take their place. There's a million other websites out there that do exactly what CNN does, but with more ethics. Especially BuzzFeed. Do I have to, do I really have to talk about how unethical and just plain flat out evil BuzzFeed is? They really? Are we at that point? Do people not know? I thought it was common knowledge. Because I need to revise my opinion. But anyway. Anyway. So yeah, that'll all be in the description. Go check all of that stuff out. I would uh, personally consider it a favor. Uh, especially if people take my fucking advice. And just send them to Coventry, guys. Send them to Coventry. Okay, so, um, now that, now that this ridiculous shit is out of the way, I'm still, I'm still just like, I don't know whether to laugh or to cry or just like curl up in the bed with my bottle of vodka and, and just wait until my body dies. You know, just try and kill myself through alcohol poisoning. Just, just, I don't know what to do other than what I've outlined here. So I think that's a pretty good... A uh, pretty good system right there that, that I've devised. If anybody else has a better idea, let me know, and we can start sending this to other people. You know, don't don't link the article. Link the archive. The archive is just a, it's just a snapshot of the web page. It's, it's like a screen cap, but more reliable, because you can fake screen caps. You can't fake an archive link. You know, people already use this to preserve tweets that people have deleted. Why not... Why not do this to effectively defund fraudulent news organizations? Anyway, anyway, I need, an, I need another hit of vodka. So, I've been, I've been rethinking J.R.R. Tolkien. Like, I've been listening to the audiobooks, and this pisses me off. This pisses me off. Uh, you probably, if you follow me on Twitter, you probably remember me exploding about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. But I was listening to uh, the audio, but I listened to The Hobbit, and I got through the, Lord, uh, the Fellowship of the Ring, and now I'm on The Two Towers. These are the only audiobooks of the Lord of the Rings series, and it pisses me off so badly. I'm a newcomer, right? I'm new in the audiobook scene, but I'm also a fucking professional. I take great pains to make sure that my audio, A, sounds good, and B, is devoid of as many mouth noises and breaths and background noise as possible. I put the cats out of the fucking room. You know, when I hear people talking and, and I see the, 
the blips on Audacity jump, the waveform jump up a little bit, like the mic is picking that up, I stop and I wait for things to quiet down, and then I repeat the line that I got interrupted in. You know, I, I and then in editing, I go through and I painstakingly by hand uphill both ways in the snow remove all of the breaths and mouth noises that I'm able to get out without making it sound like it's not naturally flowing speech. You know what I mean? So if somebody, if a character in a book is talking, I won't edit out the breaths there because when people speak, they breathe. So I'll leave that in. But when it just comes down to the pros, I find that it keeps the flow of immersion a lot better if you just nix those. Just cut them out. And maybe it has something to do with the fact that I'm listening to these books on earbuds. Or maybe it has something to do with when they were recorded. I think they were recorded in the 90s. Or maybe they were recorded to be, you know, simultaneous releases with the movies. I don't remember. I would have to look it up. And I can't be fucked to do that right now. Point is, there's, there's breaths. There's badly delivered lines. There's all kinds of fucking mouth noises. There's background noise. I shit you not, guys. I heard fucking construction equipment going on in the background of the Fellowship of the Ring. This is before they get to Rivendell. So if you have the audiobook, get your best fucking earbuds and go listen to the part before they get to Rivendell and just listen for those background noises and tell me I'm fucking crazy. They're there. I didn't make this shit up. It is so fucking unprofessionally done. And the company that did it is Recorded Books. And I cannot fucking believe they actually said, yeah, this is good to publish. Yeah, we'll just have this guy record in his fucking kitchen, you know, with his wife and his kids, you know, it, it, doing shit in the background and talking and, you know, all of those chair noises that we absolutely could have edited out because they come in between lines. And all of these pauses that this old fart takes to get his breath together. And the guy is not a great narrator. They far, you know, I, I like to think that I have enough experience and enough talent on my end to be able to tell a good audiobook narrator from a great audiobook narrator from a bad audiobook narrator. This guy is not great. He's barely good. Like, if you could have gotten other people to play the individual characters, like if they had hired someone to voice Aragorn and someone to voice Saruman, and someone to voice Gandalf, and Frodo, and Bilbo, and Merry and Pippin, and all of these other characters. It would have been great. The guy reads prose great. He's got this really nice storyteller voice. Um, and you can just you can just picture him sitting in like a comfortable living room with a fire crackling in the in the fireplace, and he's just like reading you the Lord of the Rings. That's it's it's a good feel. But everything surrounding that, like when he tries to do voices, and and he barely tries. It's just it's horrible. It's a horrible fucking production. But thanks to copyright law, these are the only recordings of these books out there. Everything else is dramatized, and it's like, you know, two or three hours long. It's barely fucking anything. It's certainly not the unabridged, you know, versions of the books, which is what I wanted, which is why I bought these, which I didn't know what kind of a crap hole I was sinking my money into. So buyer beware. If you're looking for the Lord of the Rings audiobooks, these are the only ones out there. The only one. So you're kind of stuck. If you want the Lord of the Rings audiobooks, you have to get these. But just be aware that you are getting an inferior product. There was no direction. There was barely any fucking editing. I'm surprised that they even mixed the sound. Shocked, as a matter of fact. But, the audiobooks aside. Let's just, let's just set the audiobooks aside. I've been rethinking Tolkien. Because this is, as I said, the unabridged version of the book. And I have criticized Tolkien in the past about being verbose and overly wordy and having a lot of fat on his stories. And in my defense, it has been like 10 years since I read these books. But I am fully willing to admit that I was wrong. I was wrong about Tolkien. Tolkien was actually like a consummate storyteller. And I'm, I'm having to eat crow right now, but I was wrong about Tolkien. So when you go listen to my podcast about Man in the High Castle, I bring up Tolkien and I say some shit that's blatantly untrue about Tolkien. I was wrong. 
and I'm sorry. I apologize to Tolkien. I apologize to the story. I apologize to his uh, his estate. I apologize for being so fucking wrong about Tolkien. Because there's two levels of Tolkien's greatness here. Like, there's not real... Like, okay, there are parts of the books that you could argue are filler. Like, for example, the Tom Bombadil scene. And the scene in the Barrow Downs. Like, you could argue that that doesn't really need to happen. Like, that doesn't really need to be there. Um, which is why they cut it out of the movies. But so far as the book story goes, all of that is necessary. All of that builds the picture of this world that he was trying to create. Those, those parts of that story in particular, this doesn't apply to all stories, just the Lord of the Rings. The parts of that story that are commonly viewed as filler, like Tom Bombadil, are necessary in giving this world its, its, its deep chasms and its high mountains. You know what I mean? And it's probably a horrible fucking metaphor, but that's the best that I can come up with right now. I've been drinking, fuck off. Speaking of drinking. Bottom shelf vodka. Jesus Christ. But all of that shit comes together to paint a more vivid picture of this world. Like, like, is the Tom Bombadil scene necessary in the movie? No, not really. But, well, I mean, because it's a movie, you know, they're trimming it down. They're trimming a book that takes like 13 hours to read. And that's just the reading time based on the, the audiobook recording. It takes like 13 hours to read. It would have been quicker if I'd done it. <laughs> this is sorry. I get, <laughs> get up in my smug priggishness. Um, it, it takes like 13 hours to read. So they're trying to parse this down to a three hour movie. And a lot of that is going to be really simple shit that you can tell in, you know, in visual show don't tell kind of stuff. Like, you know, there will be a paragraph about how Aragorn, Gimli and Legolas are preparing for battle. And all of that you can do in three seconds in a movie screen. So there's some stuff that's going to be drastically shortened just by virtue of your showing, not telling. And there are certain scenes that are, you know, so far as the main thrust of the story goes, they're kind of ancillary. But when you're reading these books, all of that shit is necessary to give the world its deeper picture, to, to let you know that this is an old place and it's been around for a long time and there are beings in this world that not even the author really has any idea of how long they've been around or what they really are which is kind of how Tom Bombadil is approached in the novels there may be essays and shit that Tolkien has written about Tom Bombadil that I just I just have no fucking idea about but you know you you take that out and you get a modern fantasy novel where everything moves really quickly and there's an action beat every, you know, five pages or so and you know, shit's happening all the time and there's no time to slow down and actually look at the world that you're in. And that's kind of the genius of Tolkien's storytelling because he does write like this is the fucking Bible, okay? It's not the most exciting prose out there, but it's not meant to be. I mean, like, there are there are many reasons that The Lord of the Rings is the most influential book series in fantasy literature, period. But the contention that Tolkien is publishing subpar material is not one of those reasons. Yes, it does read a little bit dry, but that's Tolkien's style. And moreover than that, just, like, kind of, just, like, divorce yourself from the mass media pop culture craze that The Lord of the Rings became when Peter Jackson made the movies. Just just put that out of your mind, okay? You don't necessarily have to put the movies out of your mind because the movies are actually pretty damn good. And as I'm, re, uh, as I'm listening to the books, the movies are actually a really, really good port of the, uh, of the books. They're, like, they had a lot of love for the source material when they made those fucking movies. Like, there was... There's a lot of shit that I, like I say, I haven't read the fucking books in like 10 years that I thought that they made up for the movies like uh, Legolas and Gimli uh, doing their doing their enemy body count thing and, and having their little contest about how many orcs they've killed and stuff like that. 
Like I thought that they made that up for the movies, and then I'm listening to the the two towers, and the Battle of Helm's Deep is going on, and they're sitting there like dick measuring about how many orcs they've killed to each other. It's fucking brilliant. <laughs> like all of the shit that we love the movies for is in the books. It is in the books. They very rarely put shit. Now, The Hobbit is a completely fucking different story that did not need to be three movies. Um, they're good movies. I liked them. I liked them a lot. But they they stretched that story, which I understand because they did need to fit it in with the rest of the movie. I mean, it was the prequel. And on further reflection, all of the things that they talk about, uh, that they show in the movie like Gandalf meeting Radagast and the Council of the Wise and everything like that, uh, that happened. It just wasn't shown in The Hobbit because The Hobbit was a far more tightly focused story just around Bilbo and the Dwarves. It wasn't shown in the books, but you could very easily extrapolate that and write scenes around it based on what happens in The Lord of the Rings. So even the shit that they added into The Hobbit to make it fit better as a prequel to The Lord of the Rings makes sense. It's not it's not like they completely pulled this shit out of their ass. Like they they stuck pretty close. Is it perfect? No. No, it's not perfect. But what what fucking is? But just think about what Tolkien did with those books. You know what I mean? Like he he wrote these books and he poured his heart and soul into them and he created this world and it became the go-to influence for everybody almost that came after him. There are certain people out there like Michael Moorcock who completely just like, fuck this. I'm going to just like write my own stories with, with hookers and blow. (laughs) But so far as mainstream fantasy goes, these are the definitive genre crafting novels out there that, inspired in one way or another everybody that came after them. Like the modern conception of elves is entirely Tolkien. All elves that you see in fantasy literature nowadays are Tolkien elves. Before Tolkien came along, there were a bunch of different like stories and rumors about elves that people had put into fiction that they had cribbed from folklore that were completely contrary to what like you can go to Rivendell and like, time kind of flows weird in Rivendell. He kind of kept that one. But, like, you're if you eat elf food in, in Middle-earth, you're not going to be dissatisfied by, by regular human food. You know, you're not going to just be able to eat elf food for the rest of your life if you eat, if you eat elf food. You know, even in a place like Lothlorien, which is, like, the exact definition of the creepy elves in the fucking woods. You know, you can go in there and time will flow differently and everything's going to be really mysterious and kind of beyond your ken. You're not going to really be able to grok what's going on. But it's not necessarily fearful unless you give them a reason to be mad at you. And moreover, just creating this world and the mythos behind it, like, the the world of Middle-earth is not just the Lord of the Rings. Like, the Silmarillion is the Bible of the Lord of the Rings. It is the tale, it is the creation myth, and the tale of the Silmarils, and all of that shit. Like, there's legends and stuff that don't even come up in the Lord of the Rings, except in in the barest snatch. You get, like, a little thing here, and it turns out he had planned on writing a whole book about that, that his son wound up expanding on, and it wasn't really as good. But, anyway... You know, Christopher Tolkien's inability to write like his father aside. Uh, he he created this world. He created languages for all of these different races and people. He created a mythology behind it. He created, from from start to finish, this world. You know, from, from the very first creation of, like, God creating the angels and and creating the world to the destruction of this world. It's all there. You just have to go out and buy the rest of the books that he's written about it. And sometimes you have to buy Christopher's books, and it's not as good. It's kind of like Brian Herbert living off the legacy of his father when he's really just not as good of an author. I I mean, Brian Herbert's a a fine author. You know, he's, he's a good storyteller and everything, but when I go and do a Dune novel, I expect Dune 
not whatever the hell the Butlerian Jihad was. So yeah, just just do me a favor. When when you're thinking about Tolkien, when you're discussing Tolkien, just go and reread the books. Just with like with your your current mindset. Like I my mindset has changed a lot since I've re- last read The Lord of the Rings. And that's part of the reason why even though, you know, I've already read them and they are on Appendix N, but I've been there done that, you know, got the t-shirt kind of thing. I'm going back just to look at it with fresh eyes. So go back and, and actually read these books again with fresh eyes. and uh, Especially if you're caught in that trap of, oh, Tolkien's so wordy and verbose and his books read like the fucking Bible and it's all boring and he'll go on for three pages about how green the fucking grass is and shit like that. That's wrong. You are wrong. I was wrong. We were all wrong about Tolkien. Go back and reread those books and you will understand why he is the most influential fantasy author of all time. There's a very, very good reason for it. And it's not just because all of the other fantasy authors of the time were memory hold. Which they were. They were. That was, either conscious or unconscious, a thing that happened. A lot of these old school pulp authors, like, uh, to an extent, Fritz Leiber and Poole Anderson and, and people like this... Were and and Jack Vance were fucking memory hold. You don't hear about those guys. Nobody, everybody will tell you, oh, go read Lord of the Rings, go read Lord of the Rings, but nobody will tell you to go, oh, go read Dying Earth, go read Fofford and the Gray Mouser. Nobody told me that. I didn't know these fucking books existed until I was like turned on to the Appendix N thing. With with Fofford and the Gray Mouser, it was a little bit before that because I had I had already been uh, exposed to some of Fritz Leiber's work and I was looking up <clears throat> audiobooks of his because I wanted to read more of his stuff. And I found Fofford and the Grey Mauser, and I was like, oh, well, this is a fantasy novel. This seems pretty cool. This is Fritz Leiber, so fuck yeah. But yes, all of those guys were memory hold, and that is a big contributor to why Tolkien is the most influential fantasy author of all time. But that is not the only reason. He actually does deserve it. So just go go back and reread the books, guys. That's all I'm asking. Just go back and reread the books because I am, and it's an eye-opening experience. Um, I, I'm discovering a new love for these books that I didn't have before. I love the books. I love the story. I love the characters. But now I really understand what Tolkien was doing, even if my vodka-addled mind isn't able to articulate it properly on this podcast. I'll probably write up a post about rethinking Tolkien sometime in the future, maybe after I finish The Return of the King, um, which I still have to buy. But <clears throat> anyway, so I've got uh, one other thing that I wanted to talk about. And this is uh, based on a blog post that I want to say Ogma linked. Um, let me see here. Yes, it was. It was It was Ogma who linked me this one from uh, harbingergames.blogspot.com. Uh, from Don't Split the Party, a blog for Rick Stump. I'm not sure who Rick Stump is, but given this post, I already like the guy. <clears throat> I'm, I'm just dying, guys. Don't mind me. I just need more vodka. I'll tough it out. Rub some dirt in my throat. Now, I'm just going to go through and read this uh, because it's not all that long. We probably read longer shit on the podcast. <laughs> Actually, wow, this is this is pretty long. But fuck it, this is my podcast. If I want to go on for two hours, then I'll go on for two fucking hours. So we'll we'll do the thing. This doesn't have to be just an hour long. So from Thursday, June 26th, 2014 at harbingergames.blogspot.com. Good isn't stupid or weak or nice. Note minor edits to clean up a point about, or to clear up a point about the Arthurian tales. And here we go. Many years ago, I had been only DMing for months when a guy I knew invited me to sit in on a game he played. He said it had a ranger, a cleric, a magic user, and two thieves. I sat with him and rolled up a paladin on my first try. I was very eager to play and described how my character rode up to the small country home they used as a base and dismounted and introduced myself as so-and-so the paladin. At that point, the entire party attacked my character and killed him in a single round. What was that all about? I asked. Paladin, said one of the players. We hate paladins. Can't stand that lawful good bull. But I thought you were a ranger, I said. I am, but we're all chaotic neutral. The DM lets rangers be neutral, he replied. 
The DM felt that killing a good person for no reason was at worst a chaotic act, which surprised me even more until, sitting in, I had a spare character because that is the way I roll, I watched this party of chaotic neutral players loot and pillage a hamlet because one of them only needed 80 experience points to level up. When they were done, they even burned the farms and barns. When I asked what they thought would happen to the 60 to 80 innocent men, women, and children whom they had just left foodless, penniless, homeless, and without any livestock, tools, or weapons since winter was less than a month away, they replied, Who cares? Just NPCs, man. When I asked them why they never played or liked good characters, they were near universal in saying, Good is stupid and weak. I was once sitting in with a party just observing as the DM ran an NPC paladin who was guiding them. The party was neutral, but on a mission from the bishop, and the paladin was the only guy that knew the way. The DM rolled an encounter, and boom! Red Dragon attacks the party. After the first round, I quietly asked the DM, Did you forget the paladin? He's just sitting there. What? He would never help neutral people. The paladin sat there on his horse, sword in its sheath and lance resting doing nothing, until the dragon breathed fire, killing half the party as well as the paladin and his warhorse. The party, with no guide and too weak from the encounter anyway, turned back. When I asked the DM why he did things that way, he said, as close to a direct quote as I can get after the years, Have you read the books? No paladin would ever help a neutral person, ever. But his inaction let an evil creature triumph. That wasn't about helping neutral people, that was about destroying evil. The lawful part means he has to do that, even if it is stupid. As I mentioned here, there's a link to another post. There also seem to be a lot of people that think good equals chivalry equals courteous equals doormat. And as I mentioned here, there are plenty of lawful stupid and stupid good characters in the official novels and modules. Time for more personal revelation. That is what a blog is for, right? I had been running my Seaward campaign for six years before I read The Hobbit and for eight years before I read The Lord of the Rings. I had spent my early years reading Edgar Rice Burroughs, H. Ryder Haggard, good choice. Andre Norton, Le Mort d'Arthur, and especially the stories of Charlemagne and the Twelve Peers. Heck, I read Vance's Lioness before I read The Fellowship of the Ring. The great thing about the books that I read first and most, from The Twelve Peers to The Return of the King, was that they all give a very clear idea of what is meant by good and evil, especially within the milieu of fantasy, be it literature or tabletop role-playing. The Twelve Peers, John Carter, Alan Quartermain, all share a few traits. They were brave, they were honest, they protected the weak, and they were decisive. They also laughed, had close friends, drank, and fought. But they were also champions of the weak, loyal friends, fierce enemies, and able to judge others by their words and deeds rather than being bigoted. John Carter not only has friends of all the races of Mars, he forges close ties between them for the first time in millennia. Alan Quartermain admires and supports Umbopa slash Ignosi, long before he learns he is a king. If a man is a good fighter and a Catholic, his past is his past to the paladins. Note that I didn't mention King Arthur or his knights here. This is because in Mallory's Le Mort d'Arthur and unlike the earlier source material, Arthur and most of the rest are actually cautionary figures. Arthur is a deeply flawed man and a poor king who begets an illegitimate son with his own half-sister, then kills all of the newborns in his lands, trying and failing to hide his sin. Merlin is capricious and advises Arthur to hide his sins through mass infanticide. Lancelot is portrayed as not very clever and, essentially, a plaything of Guinevere, who believes his sins are not sins because the queen says so. Gareth is underhanded and deceitful in his quest for fame and tries mightily to break his chastity. The list goes on. Suffice it to say that Le Mort d'Arthur was written during the War of the Roses and was meant to be a warning about men who claimed to be good but were not. It is truly unfortunate that Mallory's work is so popular that many modern readers mistake the figures in his version of the stories as examples rather than warnings. And I suspect that this may have a lot to do with the confusion some have over how to play good. Modern culture is saturated with King Arthur and the Knights as being exemplars of knighthood when they weren't. I think that there is also a tendency to look at a guy in black armor covered in spikes with red glowing eyes and say, ooh, badass, then look at a knight in shining armor and say, meh, not as scary looking. One of the best and funniest examples of this was the South Park episode Damien, which features a boxing match between Jesus and Satan. All of the townspeople who call themselves Christians bet on Satan because he is big and scary looking. Never mind that in Christianity, Satan has no chance of even surviving the presence of Christ if he were to so will. So let's talk about how good doesn't mean soft, stupid, nice, or weak. Please read this personal note. Basically, the guy's a Catholic, and this doesn't. This is about RPGs and AD&D, not you know, blah 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 blah. 
I'm far from the first guy to point out that good is not weak. C.S. Lewis directly addresses this more than once, perhaps most famously in this quote. Then is he safe? asked Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Didn't you hear what she told you? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. Or this one, more detailed, is less famous. Are you thirsty? said the lion. I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink, said the lion. May I? Could I? Would you mind going away while I do? said Jill. The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. And as Jill gazed at its motionless bulk, she realized that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Will you promise not to do anything to me if I do come? said Jill. I make no promise, said the lion. Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she had come a step nearer. Do you eat girls? she said. I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. It didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were sorry, nor as if it were angry. It just said it. I daren't come and drink, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, coming another step nearer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream said the lion. Both of these quotes from C.S. Lewis are concerning Aslan the lion, who is a stand-in for Jesus Christ. Lewis was eager to dispel the mistaken concept that being good means being soft, weak, or harmless. Another fiction writer eager to dispel the notion that good is soft or dumb is Terry Pratchett. Two of his quotes are, quote, just because you are an angel doesn't mean you have to be a fool, and something Vimes had learned as a young guard drifted up from memory. If you have to look along the shaft of an arrow from the wrong end, if a man has you entirely at his mercy, then hope like hell that man is an evil man. Because the evil like power, power over people, and they want to see you in fear. They want you to know you're going to die. So they'll talk. They'll gloat. They'll watch you squirm. They'll put off the moment of murder like another man would put off a good cigar. So hope like hell your captor is an evil man. A good man will kill you with hardly a word. And other sources are also pretty clear that good is not weak. I will bless them that bless thee and curse those who curse thee. God. <laughs> Genesis 12.3. <laughs> like, God. <laughs> and then he said unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise a scrip. And he that hath not, let him sell his coat and buy a sword. For I say to you, that this that is written must yet be fulfilled in me. And with the wicked was he reckoned, for the things concerning me have an end. But they said, Lord, behold, there are two swords. And he said to them, It is enough. Luke 22, 36-38 There are many other examples to demonstrate that good is not about being weak or completely pacifist. I would also like to point out that while the modern understanding of angels is something like this, and it's a very uh, cutesy drawing of an angel, it's just like a little girl in a dress with you know, white fluffy wings and a halo floating through clouds and everything. It's very cute. The medieval image of an angel was like this. And that is a picture of a muscular dude in armor with big ass eagle wings and a spear standing on a demon about to poke his brain case open with this fucking spear he's got in his hand. He's also wielding a sword. Very badass imagery. That is, this is the article or the post again. That is St. Michael the Archangel beating Satan like he owes him money, by the way. <laughs> Traditionally, while demons might be able to overwhelm any human, they stood no chance against angels and typically fled at their approach. While movies like The Prophecy and Constantine change this in the hopes of good storytelling, they skew the traditional concept of the power of angels and nerf them pretty badly. In the Bible, when an angel appeared to a human, their mere presence was so overwhelming that the first thing they usually said was a variation of, don't be afraid. John Milton mentions this in Paradise Lost Book 4 when he wrote, Abashed the devil stood, and felt how awful goodness is. Medieval books of magic warned would-be summoners to never attract the notice of an angel, and certainly never to summon one, because angels would destroy them for attempting to make pacts with evil, and their power was so vast no warding circle could stop them. But Rick, you ask, what does this have to do with making my campaign or characters more interesting? Simple. Two things. 
First, making good something other than not evil, and making it not stupid, not soft, and not nice, can easily make your campaign much more balanced and believable. That's right, believable. How often have you seen a campaign where each and every top villain is lovingly detailed? Every spell, every item, every foul minion, every dungeon cell, with multiple sketches of just how awesomely badass the villain looks. There are tales of how deadly the dragons are, how evil the cultists are, how depraved the anti-paladins are, etc. But not a word about how great the good guys are. No floor plans for the cathedral. No list of minions for the archbishop. Not a sketch of the head of the paladin's abbey. No legends or tales or songs about the good guys. Sure, sure, I get it. The players won't be looting the cathedral and fighting the archbishop to the death someday. We all hope. And you could look at that list of magic items the Dark Emperor's bodyguard has as a loot summary. The songs and stories are supposed to be what the party is going to build, etc. But this makes it look like there is no good other than the party. If you know how the evil overlord got that way, do you know who opposes him while the characters are first level? If the characters fail, there is a possibility of failure in your campaign, right? Then is the world doomed because the next guy is an incompetent ninth level non-adventuring abbot? In short, a campaign with an ecosystem of good guys to match its ecosystem of bad guys is going to make a lot more sense and add a lot more drama. I know that a story is only as good as its villain is a truism, but how threatening or scary is the villain if good sucks? How rewarding is being the best paladin when paladins are dim? Second, I am personally offended by so many bland, boring, uninteresting good guys. Being a paladin should not make you one of the less memorable members of the Osmonds. Punch it up a bit. Good guys can be quirky, odd, funny, you name it. But far too often, I see good characters played as boring, vapid, banal, bland, stupid, and nice. One of the more humorous takedowns of good is stupid and soft in recent literature is Captain Carrot of the Terry Pratchett books. Here are some quotes about Carrot. You're being reasonable again. You are deliberately seeing everyone's point of view. Can't you be unfair even once? And Colin thought Carrot was simple. Carrot often struck people as simple. He was simple. The mistake people made was thinking simple meant the same thing as stupid. Let's look at a quote from Carrot. Have, have you got an appointment? He said. I don't know, said Carrot. Have we got an appointment? I've got an iron ball with spikes on, Nobby volunteered. That's a morning star, Nobby. Is it? Yes, said Carrot. An appointment is an engagement to see someone, while a morning star is a large lump of metal used for viciously crushing skulls. It is important not to confuse the two. Isn't it, Mr... He raised his eyebrows. Buffo, sir! But, so if you could perhaps run along and tell Dr. Whiteface we're here with an iron ball with spy... What am I saying? I mean, without an appointment to see him? Please? Thank you. This is a wonderful example of how a good person can be courteous and intimidating all at once. And let's pause and think about paladins in D&D for a minute. I mean, really examine them, shall we? Paladins are as good at combat as fighters, and ever so slightly better than rangers, that delayed multiple attacks thing. They are as tough as a fighter in hit points and armor class. They can heal themselves or others once a day by touch. They are immune to disease. They get a plus two on all saves. They can eventually turn undead and cast cleric spells. They can detect evil at will. And they are surrounded by an aura of good power that repels evil. An aura that can be boosted by the power of a holy sword until it can negate magic. Or, put another way, a paladin is a professional warrior who is tougher to kill, faster to heal, and eventually capable of magic, because they are so very good or even simpler, they are professional killers that hate evil and that evil can't hide from. When a paladin rides into town, evil people should be scared. Of course, the paladin knows that he is the number one target of every miscreant cultist and were-rat in his vicinity. Remember that minimum wisdom requirement? Paladins may be polite and even kind, but they are not fools. Why not have that hooded figure in the dark corner of the inn be a cold, quiet paladin? He is courteous, if very quiet, cold, and distant, but comes across as an implacable, driven killing machine, which he is. 
The guy in the inn laughing and telling jokes in between singing drinking songs and playing the lute can certainly be lawfully good, so why not have a happy, jovial paladin that gets rid of excess wealth by spending his money freely on buying others drinks and food, giving gifts to his friends, and with generous charity to strangers and the poor? And mix up your NPCs. Archbishop Turpin could cleave an enemy in twain with one blow of his sword. What if the local bishop who gives your party their go-fight-evil missions is also the swordmaster that trains the party's paladin when he levels up? The really obnoxious city guard can be very dedicated to fighting evil. He just has a short temper. You get the idea. So please, make those good guys stand out. End of post. Now I realize that that took a little bit of time. But I felt it was important to read the whole thing in its entirety. Because I fully 100% agree with this right here. Good is not stupid. You know, as, as a wandering scarecrow, the guy, the guy who's playing the paladin in uh, the laughably dapper D&D game. Or it's Pathfinder, but Pathfinder is basically 3.5 with a couple of changes there to avoid copyright infringement. Um... The wandering scarecrow often says when he's when he's playing the paladin and doing the RP thing, you know, it's lawful good, not lawful nice. You know, he he does the right thing. He does the objectively good thing. And he mentions uh, uh, Rick Stump mentions in this in this post that good and evil are moral absolutes in D and D land. Like the moral ambiguity shit don't fly in D&D. That necromancer wants to kill literally everybody in the kingdom and raise them all into zombies so he can knit them together in his flesh golem and then make war on the kingdom next door with the bodies of the weak. And wow, I got really involved in my plans for my necromancer character. <laughs> anyway... <clears throat> Good and evil are things. <laughs> they are they are moral absolutes in D and D, or at least they're supposed to be. Like I've read I've read stories about like people that just get sidetracked and shit with like stupid shit. Like they consider this to be a greater evil than you know the necromancer raising an army and shit. Like I read I read one about this like SJW type characters who. Uh, instead of actually going out and leveling up and, you know, getting more powerful so they can fight the bad guys, they go out and they try to get equal rights for women in in the society that, that their characters live in. Like, they go on this, this rampant ideological crusade, and then, like, two sessions after they decide to do this. Yes, they do get equal equal rights for women and there are women rulers and shit like that and women in parliament. And then this giant army of zombies just sweeps over the countryside and kills literally everybody. End of fucking campaign. Like, that's that screwed up moral compass thing. That's that this evil that I can see right here that I am ideologically... Uh, uh, attracted to in real life that I am I am worried about in real life. That's a better way of putting it. That I'm worried about in real life is a greater evil in this fictional D and D world than actually going out and solving the fucking problem with the necromancer who wants to kill everybody. But this whole this whole good is stupid and everything. Like I cannot fucking believe these people who uh, he mentions at the start, like, the, oh, the, the paladin is, is lawful good. He wouldn't ever help neutral people. Like, motherfucker, have you ever done any research into the church? Like, they help all kinds of people. All kinds of people. Like, A Canical for Leibowitz does this, uh, does this quite nicely with the character of the poet. He's this, this sacrilegious asshole, this sacrilegious atheist asshole that they let live at the fucking monastery because they're so fucking nice people. They're, they're such nice people that they let this dude who does almost nothing but make fun of them for 100% of the time that he is in the, the monastery live there. And they're exasperated and they express that exasperation and they give him shit and everything like that. But they still let him live there and they still feed him and they still treat him like a fucking human being and they still help him when he needs help. You know, or or 
all of the uh, all of the soup kitchens that are run by religious organizations that help uh, that help people who like I could be homeless and I'm a godless atheist drunk heathen debauching myself nightly every night. But if I were homeless and I went up to a Catholic soup kitchen, there is a nine out of ten chance that those people would still help me because I was poor, because I was in need of help. And Jesus said, go out and help those who need it. I'm paraphrasing, but you get the idea. And then there's like the Crusades. Like those people thought that they were doing fucking God's will by going into the Middle East and slaughtering them some Muslims, which might need to happen again. But <laughs> Deus Volt! <laughs> I'm just digging around. But like, you get what I mean? Like there are warriors in God's service. Like, I grew up in a fucking Southern Baptist church and we read all of the nasty parts of the Bible where people died and got their heads chopped off. And you are meant to be a warrior in my service. And, and like the armor of God is it, it's analogous to medieval fucking armor and, and picking up swords and shit like that and going out and killing bad people. Like even Buddhists, even Buddhists, I I got to meet a fucking, uh, uh, I think he was a bodhisattva, um, according to their to their faith. But he, I, I was taking this college class on Buddh Buddhism one time, and these guys, uh, they this guy came in and he was just like talking to everybody about Buddhism and trying to explain his faith to a bunch of fucking Westerners who didn't really understand. And uh, one of the things that came up is that Buddhism is the middle path, you know? Uh, so if, let's say I learn, this is the example that I brought up to him. Let's say I learn that, you know, somebody is going to try to assassinate the leader of a country. And this is going to throw Like, so let's say we have an Archduke Ferdinand situation and I learn about it. In Buddhism, is it moral for me to kill that person so that they do not get to kill somebody else? He's like, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Kill him. Do it. Do it. You won't, you won't get one whit of negative karma about that <laughs> because, you know, it, it's, it's for the good of all of the people that would be thrown into war and turmoil and starvation and all of that shit can be avoided if you just kill that one guy. And further, with the with the uh, connection to tabletop games, like I, I my character in that same that same thing with the it's not lawful good it's lawful it's not lawful nice it's lawful good, um, it, it's lawful good not lawful nice that's it. Sorry, I remember, I need to stop drinking vodka, but I'm not gonna. I play a, a tiefling, uh, evil cleric, and yeah, tiefling, read me out, guys, for for being such a fucking edge lord. Like, you're talking to a guy who unironically digs red and black as a color scheme. I think it looks cool. I think it looks good. I think it's a good combination of colors. I don't care how many OCs are put out on DeviantArt with this particular color scheme. I will never not like red and black. So so creating a tiefling character isn't exactly, you know, out of the out of the realm of possibility on my end. Um so if you wanna if you wanna fucking read me about that, then then go the fuck ahead. You're not gonna bother my ass. But yeah, I play a tiefling uh, uh, evil cleric, and my character is lawful evil. But because he's evil, and the vast majority of the laws in this land are good laws, we're not exactly you know running, we're not exactly skipping through Mordor if you get me. Instead of conforming to the laws of the land, he conforms to his own personal code that he was brought up with in the church that he, uh, that he grew up in because he was, you know, the sire of a human woman and a demon. Um, he, he really doesn't fit into human society and he gets in trouble with the law and people look at him fucking funny because he's got horns and wings and a, and a prehensile tail and shit like that. You know, pe people look at him a little bit fucking off. They give him the stink eye. And, and he gets in trouble with the law, and he's wanted, officially, at this point. Like, we, we actually got into a, uh, an area where I had to talk myself out of being arrested. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> but, 
because my character is evil and he is evil, like the primary way that this that this religion that he he belongs to uh, perpetuates itself is they kidnap children and indoctrinate them into the religion. And he's done that before. <laughs> he was actually one of the children that was kidnapped. So he, he views it as a good thing. You know, how do you know that I actually, I actually brought this up in a game? Like, you know, well, well, kidnapping these kids is actually, is actually a good thing because, you know, when we bring them into the church, we ensure that they get their daily beatings so that discipline is instilled in these kids. And, you know, well, what, what if we had just let these kids live with their real parents who loved them? Then, you know, how could you be sure that they were actually being beaten properly. <laughs> and it's all fun and games. Like, I stopped taking this this uh, campaign seriously a long fucking time ago. So I just I just do kind of dickish shit <laughs> and be and be as evil as possible within reason. But he also he also does things like, you know, in the first in the first a uh, thing like a, a prison blew up and there were some people trapped by rubble and instead of just running off to save his own skin his personal code because we had all like the the party members had come together to escape the prison they were kind of bound by this this uh commitment to work together and he couldn't leave these people behind and just fucking run off with the half of the party that ran off he had to stay there and help them and try to heal uh do what he could to heal people even though he was just a level one cleric, you know, so there are, there are ways to make your, your good characters interesting by giving them quirks. Like the guy who, uh, who's really, really fucking good. And he donates all his, his money that he doesn't need to an orphanage. And he's got a really fucking mean temper, especially when he starts drinking, you know, and he sees somebody stealing in a bar and he just cuts their fucking hand off. You know, or something like that. Or uh, the guy, uh, Agma, actually uh, brought this up in uh, in this conversation on Twitter I had with him. He's he's running a game um, where he basically took a uh, Rooster Cogburn from True Grit. And if you've never read True Grit, fuck all the movies. I haven't even seen the Jeff Bridges one. I really, really want to because I heard that Jeff Bridges did a really fucking good job with Rooster. But I, I saw the John Wayne one and it was really good. I liked it. But the book was way better. So go read the book True Grit. But the book True Grit, Rooster Cogburn is basically a paladin. He's He's this lawful arm of good and... He's he's out there to make the fucking bad guys pay for it, and he's not afraid to kill people, but he also has this young woman who he views as his charge, and he gives her a lot of shit over the course of that book. Like, he tries to toughen her ass up in the worst way possible. <laughs> like he, he, he basically just, like, lets her drown and, and all of that shit. Like, she doesn't die, but uh, it's, it's like he's tough love is a mild way of putting it. But he's at heart a good man, and he always tries to do the right thing, and he's out there to get the bad guys. And yes, he has a fucking drinking problem. And yes, he has a fucking gambling problem. And and yeah, he, he kills people a lot. But he's still a good person fighting on the side of good. So you you can spice up these good characters, man. You You can... Make them interesting. Good is not stupid, weak, or nice. Gandhi is not good. Gandhi is not the end-all, be-all of good. Sometimes good requires picking up a fucking sword and killing somebody who's about to slaughter a bunch of children for no reason. And with that, with that, I think I've rambled on long enough. We're almost uh, the uncut version of this, which you, you guys honestly don't want to hear, is uh, about an hour and 20 minutes long. So I'm going to introduce this new segment that I have right here uh, called the quote unquote sponsors until somebody actually decides to sponsor me. So if you if you like what I do here and you want to and you want to support my efforts to uh, actually make a fucking career out of out of the voice work that I do, um, you can find uh, the Catherine Kimbridge Chronicles audiobooks on Audible. I have done three of them. I've done uh, six, seven, and eight, and I do get royalties off of those. So, so if you go and buy that, that is money in my pocket. Um, also, on my Bandcamp, I have a, a couple of narrations up there. I have uh, a collection of holder stories. 
uh, like the holder of blah, blah, blah. Um, and those are up there, uh, for, I, I don't even, I don't even remember how, how much I was, I was selling them for. Let me see. Yeah, that's like five bucks. Cause a lot of, a lot of effort went into that, but, uh, you're getting like, I want to say roundabouts an hour, not quite, maybe 45 minutes or so, uh, for five bucks. And it's, it's me reading the holder stories. And this was for a, uh, a, uh, cancer charity that the creepypasta community was going to be putting together, and that never really took off. So I decided to put those up on my Bandcamp, and you can find all of those up there. Those are not on my YouTube... Well, a couple of them are on my YouTube channel. But the vast majority of them are not on my YouTube channel. You can't find them. Uh, this is the only place you can really get them. And uh, I think you can buy by track, but the whole thing, the whole shebang is like five bucks. I also have my Halloween countdown of 2014, which is a bunch of, uh, that one's also $5, which is also uh, a bunch of uh, classic creepypasta stories. So we got like the creepypasta survival guide, the rake, smile.jpg, gateway of the mind, support group for serial killers and psychopaths, which was done with a few of my friends from Laughably Dapper, uh, the gristers, Huntsville camping trip, uh, Tulpa, the cave, and no end house. And some of those had to be split up because uh, they won't let you upload a file that's over a certain size, so I had to split a couple of them into a, into two parts. But <clears throat> you get the whole shebang for five bucks. And uh, I also have a version of The Egg by Andy Weir, which is up for one dollar. Um, and that's it. <laughs> it's just It's just one buck. And then there are voice commissions. So yes, I, I will open up commissions and each job will be different based on what you want me to record but if you want me to record a thing you can pay me and i will record it um i'm not i'm not quite so uh wealthy in free time as someone like prized voices so i don't have uh i don't have time or ability to film little like vine style short movies of myself but uh if you want me to record your thing for your youtube channel for your uh, whatever it is, your audiobook, your, uh, your audio drama. I do voice acting. I can do a bunch of different voices. Uh, so all, all of that stuff, just get in touch with me at, uh, jimfear138 at gmail.com and we will hammer it out and, uh, we will get you your audio shit. And it is all very high quality files. I, I have uh, heard nothing but good things about all of the uh, quality of the audio that I've sent off, even back when I was working with my Snowball. But I've upgraded my kit since then, and uh, I'm doing a lot better. I can get very good quality. The best. It's the best quality, let me tell you. But no, it's it's practically studio quality for, you know, none of that price. Like, a completely cut out studio cost and all of that. All you'll be paying is uh, my labor. Um... If it's if it's just voice work, if you don't want it edited, we'll we'll hash all of that out. So prices vary. I can't really give you a set price until you tell me what you want me to do. But if you want me to record your thing, I will record your thing. So hit me up at uh, jimfear138 at gmail.com and we will talk about some audio commissions. So, yeah, uh, that's how you can help me out if you want to support me, guys. Thanks. I really Really hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast. I hope it has been uh, been edifying and interesting and has opened a new vistas of thought in your mind or or that you just like you just like played viscera cleanup detail and listened to it and enjoyed it. So yeah, that's it. That's the podcast. Thank you guys very much for listening. Love y'all all. Peace out. See you next week.